How much electricity does it take to grow your salad? We're in an energy industry. We're consuming energy to, to create this produce. Food is energy for our bodies, but it takes a lot of fossil fuels to make our food. We're, we're definitely a big um, driver of energy use, all the way from farms to retail food stores and restaurants. Um, and so when we see energy prices pop up, you'll sometimes see that food prices almost go up in tandem because of that. Growing, processing, storing, and cooking our food accounts for a huge portion of our global energy use. We like the idea that something is more clean than another thing. Everything that we eat is dirty. It's created with, with coal and with diesel. Energy sources that we don't necessarily think about when we're eating a salad. And there are a lot of people looking for ways to cut back on the fossil fuels in our food chain. Farmers naturally have a tendency to have a very independent nature. The first step of that is being able to produce your own energy, actually being your own energy generator. Maybe some of what we're doing in the name of convenience or our health has un unintended implications about the energy needed to produce food that way. We show communities that they can take what they've thought of as garbage for decades and thrown away at great expense, and they can put it to work as a valuable energy and fuel source. Some estimates find growing and making our food accounts for as much as 30% of the world's energy use. In looking to find where that use happens, we find energy costs spread through the entire food chain. Wyoming Public Radio's Stephanie Joyce takes us through it. So yeah, we've got some kale growing here. And there are few places where the connection between food and energy is more start, obvious than at the Bright Agritech warehouse in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, you know, I didn't know that these were edible, though. You didn't? No, I didn't. Not until they planted them. Bright Agritech sells growing systems to indoor farmers. CEO Nate Story says because of that, he thinks about energy a lot. When we start paying for electricity directly, it becomes obvious that we're in an energy industry. We're consuming energy to, to create this produce. In Bright Agritech's case, the kale and microgreens and edible flowers are a direct product of coal, which supplies most of Wyoming's electricity. Yeah, I'm going to turn on a few. Is that all right? The energy inputs are obvious in the Bright Agritech warehouse. But they're hidden everywhere in our food supply chain. Up to a fifth of our nation's total energy use goes into growing, transporting, processing, and eventually preparing our food. Just need another uh, two ounces. Hayden Christensen thinks about that energy every day. And how many hours a day are you gonna have these lights on? I'll probably work them up to 14 to 18, roughly. Christensen grows herbs and lettuce and grow rooms and greenhouses just outside Fort Collins, Colorado. He uses new high-tech LED lights. They're just, they're a lot more efficient. Um, these are 300 watt, they say they're an equivalent of an 1,000 watt uh, regular light. Although labor and packaging are Christensen's biggest expenses, he says energy costs do add up. He estimates that in an average clamshell of basil, which retails for $1.50, nine cents was spent on electricity. Once his herbs are packaged, Christensen loads them up and takes them to a local Whole food store where they're sold. In this case, that trip is short. But even longer trips, say from a farm in California to the same Fort Collins Whole Foods, don't actually use a whole lot of energy, says ag economist Don Filmany. Everyone does assume, because they see the trucks, the trucks are the visible part, that the transportation sector is a huge part of both the cost and the energy of food production, and they're really quite minimal. Transportation accounts for less than 10% of all the energy used in the food chain. So what does actually consume a lot of energy? The store itself. We used 3 million kilowatt hours last year, which equates to approximately $240,000 for one year of electrical usage. In essence, all of our systems kind of competing with one another. You have HVAC trying to compete with the refrigeration. Refrigeration is trying to compete with the heat outside. Lighting's also uh, struggles based on daytime versus nighttime. So if any of the systems are off by a little bit, uh, it, it somewhat creates issues throughout the whole environment of the store. In other words, the fridges and freezers that keep your salad fresh and ice cream cold add up. 
Whole Foods has also installed more efficient lighting, as well as solar panels on the roofs of many of its stores. But it turns out retailers aren't even the biggest energy consumers in the food supply chain. In fact, they aren't even the second biggest. That distinction goes to something we consumers almost never see. The food processing sector. Even when we're buying at stores now, we're wanting things convenient. So we used to buy heads of lettuce, now we buy bag salad mixes. Or we used to buy chicken, now we buy the chicken already rotisseried with a marinade on it. So um, all those things that were in the name of convenience have tended to both make it be more energy intensive and more processed in a way. All that processing contributed to food-related energy consumption growing six times faster than overall energy consumption between 1997 and 2002. But the biggest energy consumer of all is also the most hidden, American households. Estimates vary, but approximately one-third of all the energy we use to produce food is consumed by us. Italian parsley. Craig Hibbert is an Inside Energy viewer and a former home energy auditor. He got in touch with us about monitoring energy use at home. And I use these little kilowatts to monitor the refrigerators. Then he puts all the information into a spreadsheet so he can geek out on the numbers. You know, a refrigerator uses uh, constant energy every day. And I, a lot of people put an extra refrigerator out in the garage, put some soda pop in it. And when you take into account the hundreds of millions of refrigerators, dishwashers, ovens, freezers, extra freezers we all have in our homes, the energy use is enormous. We're not intentionally making bad decisions, we're just uninformed. People will just make very constrained decisions on whatever's there, what's convenient. But in the next few years, expect to see more attention paid to the energy and climate impacts of our food. Today, people often look for organic or local labels on their food. In the future, perhaps they'll be looking for energy efficiency labels, too. The food we eat starts on the farm, right? And farmers, they're always looking for ways to cut their reliance on fossil fuels, even if they're only focused on the bottom line. As Grant Gerlach of Harvest Public Media tells us, there are indirect ways to keep fossil fuels out of the cornfield. Greg and Sandy Brummond live and farm in northeast Nebraska, just outside the town of Craig. But they're rarely in their home. Mostly, you'll find them here. This is our shop that we do most of our repair work and uh, just literally, literally about live up here. This shop is the epicenter of the Brummond farm and its energy use. With the lights, machinery for equipment repair and other implements, it uses more power than their home. In fact, sometimes it is their home. The shop and its high energy needs are why the Brummonds made a recent investment in solar energy. We've got 36 panels mm -hmm. down there, and uh, we, we chose that building. The angle was good for the sun. These panels are capable of supplying 10 kilowatts, enough power for all those lights and machines in the shop. They were put up a few months ago by Graham Christensen, who runs a small business installing solar panels and advocating for green energy. Well, you can see even on today, which is a, a cloudy day outside, we're still producing 506 watts of energy currently. Christensen grew up on a farm in Burt County, not far from the Brummins. Today, he's back in the area with an electrician to survey another farm for solar potential. Down the, this side of the lane, we might put in some geothermal wells. Kevin Anderson would like to install enough panels to generate 25 kilowatts. That'd be double the capacity of the Brummins. Basically with 25 kilowatts, it'd get soaked up right into these buildings, um, this grain elevator, all the fans on the grain elevator, the dryer that they have connected there, um, I, I believe is elect electrical, um, and all the outbuildings around, and then as well as their, their homes. Federal tax credits and government grants are making renewable energy more affordable. Solar is the popular choice for farmers looking to cut energy expenditures. According to a 2013 USDA report on agriculture and energy, 93 percent of farms that produce renewable energy use solar. Because how many panels would we need for 25? Anderson wants to take advantage of the financial incentives while they're available, but that isn't his only motivation. It seems like as you get a little older, you get a little more concerned about it. A legacy we're leaving our kids and what type of environment they're going to live in grandkids, their kids. I think it's the right thing to do. 
Farmers naturally have a tendency to have a very independent nature. The first step of that is being able to produce your own energy. Back on the Brummins farm, they've got hopes of adding more panels and using less energy from the local utility, which mostly generates power from coal. And I flew over Gillette, Wyoming, which was kind of interesting. That's where a lot of our coal comes from. And to get that perspective of looking over those humongous holes in the ground where the coal is taken out, I was like, wow, I wonder when this is going to run out. U.S. agriculture used around 1,600 trillion BTUs of energy in 2011, enough to power the energy needs for a state like Iowa or South Carolina for a year. Most of that energy is for direct uses, like electricity for buildings or gasoline for tractors. But farms also use a lot of energy in indirect ways. For instance, farmers apply synthetic fertilizers to restore nitrogen in the soil for plants to eat. Those fertilizers are part of the reason crops like corn show big yields every year. But they come from fossil fuels. Most nitrogen fertilizer production comes from natural gas. After fuel for trucks and tractors, fertilizer is the second largest energy input on farms and one of the biggest expenses for farmers. In Bladen, Nebraska, Keith Burns and his brother Brian have developed a business from an old solution to the fertilizer equation. It starts with these seeds, designed and sold to grow crops not for harvest, but to make soil healthier. We can produce, you know, anywhere from 100 to 200 pounds of nitrogen from a, from a cover crop if it has sufficient time to grow. Green now, cover seed cover supplies seeds and mixes of seed like that produce plants for an old practice called planting a winter crop, or cover crop. What are cover crops and why are they called that? Well, cover crops are basically crops that a farmer would plant in between periods of their normal cash crop. When we have something growing, we're taking that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and we're fixing it either, either into the plant material, which will become organic matter eventually, or more importantly, we're putting that carbon into the soil through the photosynthetic process. That carbon that gets put into the soil is what becomes the immediate food source for all these microorganisms. This is a, a winter oats, and, and I pulled up a chunk here just to show you the roots. Those microorganisms are what Brian and Keith want to show off. You can, you can take a good, healthy soil, and you can smell it, and it just has that really good, earthy smell. Instead of yields above the ground, the Burns brothers point to a harvest taking place below the ground, carbon transferred from the atmosphere nitrogen fixed in roots and in soil. You know, this, this whole thing right here is very high in nitrogen. When it decomposes in the spring, it'll release quite a bit of nitrogen for my next corn crops. The practice of planting cover crops is growing, but it isn't something new. Farmers were planting cover crops 100 years ago. They would go through there between the corn rows and they'd be planting wheat, or they'd be planting wheat and sweet clover. That was the original no-till cover crop seeder. Now we got away from it because with the advent of cheap commercial fertilizers, with herbicides, with hybrid seeds. With the right cover crops, farmers can grow more fertilizer for themselves. How much can vary. Cover crops are vulnerable to cold and dry weather, and they might not give off all their nutrients right when the new crops need it. A lot of oil needed to make any type of fertilizer, and so anytime we don't need it to produce it, we don't need it to haul it, we don't need it to apply it if we can grow it naturally through a cover crop. Even when farmers and grocers try to cut down on their fossil fuel use, there's still a lot of waste left behind. But we traveled around Colorado to find out how that waste could still be valuable. John Slutsky has been milking cows since the early 1980s. His professional life rising and falling with what his livestock excrete. And not just from their udders. It's like a buffet for the manure connoisseur. Manure. The dirty, dark side of working with these adorable Holsteins is the enormous logistical challenge of dealing with waste. Slutsky considers himself an environmentally conscious guy, so he worries about all the methane produced as that manure breaks down. Then the whole methane thing and, and, and uh, greenhouse gases, all of that is more important to many in our industry. If only he lived about 50 miles southeast. This is Heartland Biogas, a new facility bringing in truckload after truckload of manure from nearby dairies 
all of the buildings and pools here add up to what's called a digester. What's brought in gets liquefied, cooked up, and mixed together, speeding up the production of methane out the other end. You, know, you can think of the digester the same as, I, as your own guts, if you can. So, so this is where all the cow poop This is the ends cow up. poop ends up right here. Bob Yost is showing me around Heartland. With a little more refining, that methane becomes chemically identical to the natural gas drilled from underground. The gas produced here goes straight into a pipeline on site, just like any other natural gas. It's injected into the pipeline, and then it's delivered to anywhere in the country. Destructive greenhouse gases that would be escaping into the atmosphere anyway, going to good use. Dairy farms have been building digesters for years, but the technology is advancing and diversifying. It turns out the way to get the most methane from your digester is to have a balanced diet of manure and food scraps. I got the turkey bacon guac burger. That's where restaurants like Denver's Park Burger come in. We do have a couple of gray recycling bins as well as bins with no bag, which is our composting setup. General um, so manager TJ McReynolds pays a little bit more for composting services on top of his trash bill. He figured it would all end up as mulch somewhere. Uh, never once said I even considered it being used for natural gas. Hundreds of Colorado restaurants, schools, and groceries have begun sending their scraps to Heartland. There could be 25, 30 semi-loads per day eventually of, of food waste coming in, and then the manure is added to that. The company Yoast works with, A1 Organics, coordinates the delivery of all that food waste. It comes in all types. A lot of it's still in packaging. Well, this had sweet tea in it. Luckily, this machine at the digester can tear all that apart to get to the valuable organics inside. Unfortunately, all of this is a prospect tantalizingly out of reach for Slutsky. His farm is too far from the Heartland facility and too small to build his own primitive digester which really only makes financial sense for operations with 2,000 cows or more. Slutsky has 1,500. But we have a business to run, and um, it's not going to do us any good if we build a digester and go out of business. It's a tough position to be in, big enough to have to deal with mounds and mounds of manure, too small to make any money off it. It's where most American dairies find themselves, their methane remaining wasted. Yet, our story does not end here, for there is another important source of concentrated organic waste. If you can picture 8 million gallons of what people have flushed down their toilets, that's what I'm smelling right now. We're at the wastewater treatment plant in Grand Junction, Colorado, and that distinctive smell of sewage is starting to smell like money to manager Dan Tonello. The plant has had a digester for decades, but most of the methane used to be flared off into the air. Not good for the environment and a waste of a wonderful resource. So the city spent just under $3 million for the natural gas refining equipment, and rather than just putting it into a pipeline or generating electricity with it, Tonello had another idea. In the evening when the trucks are done with their routes, they hook up, fill up. Grand Junction has been replacing an aging fleet of garbage trucks and buses with natural gas vehicles, fueled mostly by the human-sourced gas from the treatment plant. Tonello says Grand Junction is the first city in the nation to do that. We're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars a year being saved by implementing this process. That's a model for small wastewater treatment plants anywhere in the country. Renewable natural gas emerged to me. Joanna Underwood works with Energy Vision, an environmental group which promotes now, this renewable natural gas. And she says a closed system like this using biogas to run a fleet of vehicles is the most efficient way to use a digester. Every time you convert a bus fleet or a refuse truck fleet or a produce delivery fleet to renewable natural gas, you've had a huge impact. Because more often than not, those natural gas fleets are replacing diesel fleets, which are much more polluting. Underwood says if all the organic waste in the country were gathered, from dairies, food producers, and sewage plants, 
current technologies could produce enough natural gas to replace about half of the diesel fuel used in the U.S. transportation sector. So not a replacement for the traditional oil and gas industry by a long shot, but Underwood argues practical solutions to climate change have to be assembled piece by piece. One thing isn't going to do it, but for this sector, which in and of itself is big, it's not a small piece. And it's a piece Dan Tonello at the Grand Junction Wastewater Treatment Plant says we can all contribute to. One cubic foot of natural gas per day, if you were wondering. With every meal, Americans are making an important energy decision. Cook from scratch or go with the processed version. Inside Energy's Lee Patterson looks at the energy costs of both. Never worn an apron before. <laughs> because I have zero baking skills of my own, I asked for professional help. So we're going to take our flour. From Kathy Guler, owner of minutes. Foodies Culinary Academy. We are going to learn to make mile high apple pie. But first, it let's get one easy, thing straight, the way Guler sees it. And you can buy a frozen pie, and if you never made a pie, you might not even know that there is a dramatic difference between fresh ingredients and the labor, the love that goes into it. I'm starting to feel like it's going yep. to take a the lot of step, my own energy to butter. make this pie. Okay. Blending ingredients for the dough to make pie crust. Okay, so here's our rolling pin. So push it. Rolling, peeling, chopping, stirring, me trying to force the warming dough into something resembling a pie crust. You've just kind of just handled it and felt it all. And when you look, buy a pie in the store, you can tell that it, the crust was stamped. It has an exact, precise, uniform, jagged pattern on the edge. No uniform patterns here. So it's a little off top, like giving it a haircut. But labor-intensive pie crusts aside, Guler says she's surprised by how unfamiliar her students are, even with the basics of cooking, like measuring flour. It takes a little practice, you know, so we have to peel apples. I did a few more than you did. <laughs> that's <laughs> and that's true. just from practice. That just practice makes perfect. There's a desire to want to learn how to do things, um, but the time, having the time available. Making meals from scratch is hard and can be really time consuming. Clearly it's easier just to buy a frozen pie crust from the grocery store. In fact, studies show we're spending a lot less time in the kitchen. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2014, we spent just 35 minutes in the kitchen on prep and cleanup. 35 minutes! And one of the ways we're cutting down time is by buying partially prepared foods, like bagged lettuce and marinated pork, that are processed by machines and then brought home from the store. To save time, we're often using more of something else, and in some cases that might be energy. Maybe some of what we're doing in the name of convenience or our health has un unintended implications about the energy needed to produce food that way. That's because with this shift, we are essentially substituting fossil fuels for human labor. Those machines that process our food, they usually run on coal or natural gas-fired electricity. And we're relying on them more and more as we outsource food prep. According to one of the few studies on this issue by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, this move towards energy-intensive processing accounted for about half of the growth in food-related energy use between 1997 and 2002. So sometimes you'll actually go through the food processing plants, and it's not robotic yet, but you'll see just as much machine time of the product being touched as individuals touching it. So there's all the energy there, of course. If you've never taken a tour of a major food processing plant, everybody should. So I took her advice and visited the Western Sugar Cooperative Facility in northern Wyoming. So right now we're almost 120 tons per hour of beets. That's how much we're cutting. Of beets, my tour guide says, sugar beets, the white root vegetable used to make your table sugar. And turning these into this requires many different machines. From retro control panels to massive motors, boilers, slicers, pumps, and diffusers, making all sorts of industrial size and grunts. And then we arrive at a conveyor belt, all loaded up with waffle fries. Whoa! That's what they look like when they've been uh, cut up. Shannon Ellis says turning beets into sugar isn't simple. Oh, it takes a little bit of doing. Yeah, it does. Every machinery has electricity going to it. Natural gas and electricity are the two biggest hits that we have. 
According to Ellis, energy accounts for over 50% of the factory's costs. If you watch right here, this is actually the sugar was just made. And is now being tossed around by a massive machine, a dryer, to remove any last bits of moisture. And that's just freshly made sugar. It's really good stuff. Fresh out of the dryer or the oven. Lucky for me, I get to take this pie home. But here's the thing. Energy inputs are everywhere in our food chain, from the machines that make our sugar to the freezer that will store my leftover pie. And when it comes to homemade food, whether it's made from scratch or from processed ingredients, there is another important factor in the already complicated energy equation, and that's food waste. Think about vegetables and dinner leftovers that end up in the trash. We waste about 35% of our food and the energy that goes into making it. For Inside Energy, I'm Lee Patterson. And don't worry, none of this pie will go to waste. As our population keeps growing, we're going to need a lot more food. And that's going to take a lot more energy to produce. But as farmers, food processors, and grocers all try to cut down on their energy use, both Inside Energy and Harvest Public Media will be there reporting. You can find more of our work at InsideEnergy.org and HarvestPublicMedia.org. I'm Dan Boyce. Thanks for watching.